Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Kristen and today I'm going to show you how to paint this fall watercolor landscape. I'll be using a size 10 and a size 3 round brush. This paper is Bao Hong Cold Press, which is my favorite lately. And then I also got some new pottery pieces, so I have put a limited palette of colors. I have a Cad Yellow, Quinacridone Magenta, Cerulean, Indigo, and Sap Green. The first thing I want to do is create a really light background that is very watery to give our landscape a base. I'm also going to be speeding this process up just a little bit because it gets really repetitive with all of the um, texture mark making. Um, so right now I'm just using clean water and I'm going to take some of the cad yellow and just start dabbing that into the watery spots and letting it kind of blend in. Um, the initial wash that I want to create is kind of the idea of really light far off trees in the distance. So I'm creating this really blotchy texture kind of in a triangular shape. I've added some magenta now to the mix to give it a little bit more of an orange feel. And I'm leaving space in the center so that I can paint that little house that you saw in the beginning. The main thing to remember with this layer is that you want it to be the lightest values, but you don't want it to be so light that when it dries, you can't see it. And then along the bottom where the road is going to be, I just did a really light wash of this purpley gray color I mixed together beforehand uh, on a previous painting that was still on my palette, but just some of the cerulean and the magenta mixed together with a little bit of yellow. And then along the sides, so I'm thinking of outlining the sides of the path, I put a little bit of the yellow kind of to give the hint of fall grass. Now that that has completely dried, we're moving on to the house first because I feel like once I get the little house in, I can anchor all of the vegetation and the trees and everything around it. You can make your house any color you want. I am really on a little blue house kick and I love the way a little blue house looks with an orange roof, but we're going to wait to paint the roof till the house is completely dry so that we don't have any bleeding and blending because blue and orange are complementary. They will make muddy colors. <laughs> but while the house is still wet, I am going to start adding in the foliage on either side of the house because I do like a little bit of blending with the foliage that is touching the house so that we don't get a lot of hard lines and layering um, if the house dries without adding any of the greenery. Before the yellow dries, I do want to add in some orange color for some dimension. So I'm mixing in some magenta with my yellow on my palette and then just kind of tapping that in. So pretty much I'm just trying to create a bush line near the house. So now that that is kind of formed, I'm going to move on to the path. When you're painting the path, make sure it's very small, farther away from you in proportion with the house. and it gets bigger and wider as it gets closer to the edge of your paper. Uh, my favorite way to make brown is using the magenta and the green mixing together a little heavy on the magenta and then add some yellow makes a really great brown. Remember that we're still in the first couple of layers of this painting. So you still want to make sure that your values are really light, meaning that you have quite a bit of water to the mixture and it's not really dark or thick or heavy on the watercolor at this point. We're just getting the basic shapes down and letting everything blend together as much as possible. Now that the house is completely dried, I'm putting the roof in and I know there's already going to be a lot of orange in this painting, so I wanted it to be a very bright yellow orange and then we can put some of the darker magenta red leaves near the roof so it kind of ties in and goes together but the leaves behind it will be significantly different. This is also a good time to determine where your light source is coming from. Um, I decided that my light source is going to come from the left so the side of the house is actually going to have the shadow and this front part of the house I'm going to keep really light blue so it looks like it's highlighted. Um, now we're going to start working on the trees above the house. We have such a nice light detail from the first layer that we did. So we, we want to enhance that without overtaking it. So I don't want to cover it 
up as much as possible, but just kind of give the impression that there's another layer. So we're keeping some of that outer layer visible and then continuing to layer more of these blotchy shapes that look like trees, um, but still in quite a very light value of color. So still a lot of water. And you can see I'm making tree shapes for the leaves and then I'm blending some of the areas out. So if you want it to look fuzzy in the distance, um, highlighted, you can make these really circular blotchy shapes with your brush to represent the leaves and then take some water and smooth some of those areas out. It looks really nice and misty and far away. Now we're going to work on adding some color in front of the house, which is still considered like the midground of the painting. And we're going to start bringing that color forward to the foreground, which is the farthest down on the page or the closest to you in perspective. I did not use a reference for this painting. I just kind of made it up as I went along, just as the painting was revealing itself to me. Um, sometimes I feel like if I work from a reference, I feel stuck in needing to follow the reference and then I'm not as loose as I want to be. So that can be tricky that way if you're following a reference. Um, but this color is one of my favorite colors. It's where you take some of the magenta and you add a tiny bit of sap green and it makes this beautiful magenta purple color. And it's great for shadows, dark areas, deep browns, that sort of thing. And I posted a short the other day talking about how we can take our really bright colors and we can add the complementary color opposite on the color wheel, add just a tiny bit and we get a really nice muted dusty fall color. So that's why I wanted to show you, you can use your same bright colors that you have on a limited palette and create fall landscapes and colors as well. All right, now because I've determined that my light source is coming from the left, I wanted to add some bushes or trees that are really dark over to the right to really enhance the feeling that there are shadows over there. And then here on the house, now that everything is dry, I can add the shadowy blue color on the side to give it really that shadowy feeling as well. Again, if you take the blue that you used, which I use cerulean, and you add some orange to that, which is the opposite color on the color wheel, you get a really nice muted blue, which makes a perfect shadow color for a bright blue house. And then for the roof, because the roof is orange, I just need to add a tiny bit of blue to get a nice shadow color on my bright orange roof. <laughs> and now I've got a little bit of magenta on my brush and I'm just going through and kind of outlining some areas on the roof and the edges of the house just to give it a little bit more detail as we go along. But again, watercolor is a layering medium. We are adding details and layers as we go. We don't have to worry about adding it all in one go. And this is a great example of it because now we're working on another layer of the trees. And as we are getting to the final layer, we are using darker and darker values of color, more vibrant yellows, more vibrant oranges, and now even some really distinct magentas. One of the reasons I love using magenta in fall paintings is because it's really striking and adds a lot of contrast instead of just using red. It gives a lot of depth to the shadowy areas of a tree. And even here on this tree that I'm painting now, I added a tiny bit of green to the magenta and it gave it a more dusty, earthy tone, which is great for fall leaves. It almost looks like a brown red. If you struggle with tree texture, I have a tip for you. I like to think of tree leaves as having a big blobby base and then small leaves that can come off of it. So I like to liken it to like a chicken, a mama hen. She's got her babies and some of the babies are peeking out. So some of the textures are coming out of the blob and some of the textures are way far out of the blob. But as long as you have the home base of the mama hen, the little bits coming off of the tree blob make sense. So I always make sure I have a big blobby bushy section for the tree that's not super textured and then I can create texture coming off of it. 
This also goes for the shadowy areas as well. When I am adding that deeper texture, I don't want to do too many little individual strokes because then it will start to look too busy. So if you have a base where there's more of a blob with bits of texture kind of coming off the edge, and then you can have little tiny leafy textures that are breaking away from the blob, but they feel like they're connected because you have that bigger base. And the big blob base doesn't even have to be that big, but it's usually bigger than a tiny individual stroke and then some of the texture can come off from there. If you kind of follow that rule of thumb, your texture will always look pretty good. Down here on the right, I kind of struggled with feeling like the balance was even, so I made it a little bit bigger and darker. And then I thought, okay, the shape is weird. It's a little too harsh and I don't want it to be harsh. So I just used water to kind of smooth out that edge before it dried. And then I said to myself, um, I'm going to come back to that later when I know what to do with it. And so you'll see what I do later. And I end up liking it, but at the time I didn't know what to do. So I thought, just let it dry. <laughs> we'll figure that out later. One of my absolute favorite things to add to a painting that has a house uh, is fence posts. And I mean, I give you full permission to add fence posts to every house painting you have because that's what I do. And I love it. I think fence posts with a house and a leafy fall background looks awesome. It just balances the whole thing. So sorry, I always add fence posts, um, but just make sure that you're doing the right perspective with the fence posts. They're going to be smaller and closer together the farther away they are from you, and then bigger and more detailed and farther apart the closer they are to you or the closer they are to the edge of the paper. Now I've pretty much got the right side of the road figured out. Um, we do need to finish off this painting with the left side of the road. And sometimes the grass in front of the cute stuff can be the most intimidating because it's so open. But if you make blotchy colors that are really watery, then you can add more intense colors and let them kind of bleed in and it looks really nice. So that's pretty much what I did on the left there is I added lighter values of yellow and kind of that brown color and then just a peak of green. Like there's still a tiny bit of green hanging on from the summer and I think that really gives a lot of dimension to this piece that has a lot of yellows and oranges and reds. Um, adding the pops of blue and green I feel like really balanced this whole painting out. Now I'm just trying to make sure that there's contrast on this side. There's a lot of dark contrast on the top of the painting and to the left of the house so I just wanted to add a few more areas of contrast to the lower part of the painting that's why you can see some of the magenta and the darker colors but again watercolor is a layering medium and we will definitely be coming back to that area once everything has dried now we're adding doors and windows to the house one of the safest ways to do that is by adding that shadow color where there is a little bit of orange added to the blue and start with that color and then you can go up to like a black or a brown later, but it's always best to start with a lighter, less intense color on something so small. One of my absolute favorite parts about painting landscapes is adding the tree trunks and branches because it really, really makes everything make sense, makes the leaves pop. And I didn't want to start with too light of a value. I kind of wanted this all to be in one deep color. So I've added indigo to my brown. So it's kind of a little bit purpley, but it's still leaning more towards the magenta side. My tip for painting tree trunks is to use light pressure and go smaller and thinner than you think you're going to need at first, because then you can always add more girth width to, to your tree trunks um, and to always remember that your tree trunks are going to be a lot wider than the top of your tree or your branches so everything gets smaller as it branches out so really really thin tiny tree trunks with the very tip of your brush towards the top and then the thicker sturdier branches are going to be towards the bottom as the trunk gets bigger and wider as it goes to the ground 
Also, make sure you're not just completely painting the tree trunk straight up and down. Look for the natural gaps that you've painted in the beginning. While that color for the tree branches was on my brush, I added some more contrast to the fence posts, focusing it on the right side because that's where more of the shadows would be. And then I added some of that color to the windows and the door to just start darkening up the house a little bit. Now we're headed into the final stages of the painting, which means we need to focus on details and contrast, figuring anything out that feels odd. So this dark area to the right still feels very unfinished, so I messed around with the texture and the balance of the colors over there, and we'll finish that off in just a second. And then I focus on adding more details and shadow to the house, making a little chimney, making the shadow for the chimney, some panels on the roof. I even add some paneling to the front of the house, you'll see, but I completely take it off later. <laughs> and then I deepen up the shadow with that dusty blue color because the house does need more contrast. My rule of thumb for when I know a painting is done is if I see light values, medium values, and dark values. If I can see those distinctly in all areas of the painting that need it, um, then I know that I'm finished. So as I'm adding some of those areas in the middle ground, I can tell that the background trees ap appeal to me. They look great. I can see the lightness, the medium, the dark values. Now I'm adding that to the house and the middle ground and then we'll move down to the foreground and just make sure that's finished before we call the painting done. But you can see I add that paneling to the front of the house and it really takes away the lightness of the front of the house. I really want that to be a stark contrast so we're gonna fix that. Another thing I'm doing as I'm finishing up this painting is just taking some really bright yellow and just filling in some space. There was some weird color spaces around the fence posts, so I just added some dabs of yellow and then in some other areas in the foreground as well. I wanted a little bit more contrast along the edges of the road so I did a brown that was very heavy on the magenta side and I added a few spots of that alongside the road and then with some clean water I kind of helped drag some of that color down the road so that it was a little bit darker and then I did a little green patch in the middle of the road it's something I like to do kind of signifies like two wheels that would come down the road and so it kind of leaves a spot for something to grow. So I let that blend in and we can add the details for that later and then we are just adding a few more details to finish it off. I wanted to add some branches into this bushy area in the middle ground by the house so I feel like it really helps tie this very dark area over to the right because I added a lot of really thin quick strokes to represent branches so it looks more like it's on purpose instead of um, just a big blob. Now it's a big dead tree blob <laughs> with a bunch of branches. Um, and then just a couple of details with that same dark brown magenta just to help tie everything together and make everything start to pop and look completely finished. As you might have noticed, I switched to the round size three brush. It is a lot smaller. It is a lot easier to get the finer details without accidentally making them too big. I think for me, sometimes I'm very stubborn and I want to just use one brush and then I get frustrated because my details don't look how I wanted them to. So it is okay to switch your brush, switch to a tiny brush and use that to make all your tiny little details, it will look so much better and refined just how you might imagine it. I did make the path a little bit darker as it's going to the house because I feel like it kind of got lost in the back there with all of that yellow. Um, and then I did a few areas of patchy color just to give the foreground a lot more texture and interest. And then this is the point where I thought I do not like those lines and the texture that I put on the front of the house. So with clean water, I just kind of use my brush to scrub at the face of the house. And then I take my rag and I dab at it until it is bright and beautiful and clean again. And I feel like that brightness really helps 
the contrast stand out more, so we really needed to bring the highlight of the front of the house back. Thank you so much for being here with me today while we painted this cute house in this fall landscape. Let me know if you like this style of the more sped up video with the voiceover, and I will see you all next time. Bye.